name is Greg Griffith. I'm the co-deputy state historic preservation officer at the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, or DAHP or DAP, as I will be saying um, this morning. Um, again, I want to welcome all of you, and I see we've got a diverse audience of members from local governments, cities and counties, state agencies, federal agencies, as well as tribal governments, uh, consultants, and private citizens. So we have a broad, broad audience this morning, and it's great that all of you are willing to take a good chunk of time out of your, your busy day to, to, to join us for our webinar. And I know that, that many of you we work with and know, know um, quite well, but others that we don't work as much with. So we have a broad audience with different levels of experience in working with us. So um, since we've got a lot to cover this morning, I want to move into the first slide that we have. And um, that's basically starting out with what do we want to achieve today with you. Uh, first of all, we want to convey a little bit about uh, what we are about and um, what we do. And not explicitly, but though we want to share with each of you kind of a little bit of glimpse in terms of how our agency operates and um, how we communicate and how we work internally. Because I know uh, when you're outside of, of your environment, out of your, your work, your office, um, that you really don't know what's going on once you send, it, send us an email or send us something in Wizard. So this gives you a little bit of a glimpse in terms of how, how our office operates and specifically how our built environment unit operates. To get into more detail, we're going to be clarifying with you this morning um, our clarifications about what we look for in terms of the materials that you are submitting to us and how we interact with you so that we're all on the same page in terms of what our expectations are and what we're looking for and how we use that information on a day-to-day -day basis. So hopefully that will give you a little bit of insights in terms of how we work and so that you under, understand about um, when we are asking for more information from you or clarifications or communicating you in one, one form or another, that you are understanding what, what kind of context we're working under. And then we're also going to want to give you some more updates in terms of our, our survey guidelines that we're working with. And, and Kim Gant has been working on those over the past year. And so we want to sort of fill you in on on that. Let's see. Next slide. Can I, how do I move forward with it? There we go. Here's our agenda this morning. So I'm going to be giving out and filling in for our State Historic Preservation Officer, Allison Brooks, um, who is unfortunately not able to join us. She is at the Periodontist this morning. So um, I know that she would rather be here joining us. Uh, but I'm fulfilling her role and kind of welcome you and going through the agenda, which you should have on your screen right now. So you'll see we've started at 930 and we built in a couple of, of breaks uh, following each presentation this morning. Um, next slide, please. Let's there we go. So a couple of things about logistics this morning that uh, before we get started to go over with you. Uh, first of all, as you can see from the slide, um, our focus this morning, um, as it was at our workshops back in December in Lacey, are on the State Historic Preservation Inventory Form, or the HPIF as we call it. Um, and I know many of you are typically typically working with uh, with the HPIF or sometimes with the archaeological inventory form or often both. Um, this morning we're going to be working with the HPIF form that documents elements of our built environment or our built environment um, uh, that address structures, buildings, districts, and objects. Um, and of course, I know many of you are, who are familiar and working with us are familiar with kind of the 
uh, the elements of the built environment uh, and all cultural resources under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, um, that those are the, the elements that, that are typically um, listed in or determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so we'll be focusing in again on HPS and documenting those elements of the built environment this morning and, and not the archaeological inventory forms that, that will be the subject of a webinar um, at some later date. Uh, number two, since we have so much information to convey to you this morning, um, as well as limited time, um, we'll be speaking in very broad generalities. Um, so we'll be getting to the kind of the details of completing the form and um, how we look at, at resources, um, but we'll be kind of speaking at a very broad level, so not getting too much into the weeds. So we just want to keep you, have you keep in mind that for real specific kinds of issues or questions um, on a particular property or project that you might be working on, uh, that that might be something that you would want to maybe talk to us um, offline at another time. Um, for our webinar this morning, to communicate with us, um, please use the chat box that you will see. Um, I think it's at the top of your screen. Um, so if you have questions or comments during the, the entire morning during our webinar, um, use that, that uh, box to communicate with us for any questions that you might have. And we're, we're sort of going with the idea of, of addressing your comments and your questions at the end of each presentation um, to sort of keep the, the flow of, the, of each presentation sort of moving and, and moving along. We found that our, our webinar, our workshop in Lacey, um, that when we stopped for, for addressing presentations, it kind of interrupted the flow and got diverted, and we kind of used up time that we needed to, to cover the basics of what we wanted to present to you. So that's kind of the modus operandi that we're working under this morning. And you will be on mute um, as well, so that you don't have to worry about distractions or, uh, or other kinds of things that might be going on. So you don't have to worry about that, and, and we've got that um, under control. Um, also, um, we want to um, to mention to you that um, again uh, that you will, if, if you do have feedback um, about our presentation, we're very anxious to receive that. And Holly will be sending out to you a, a feedback form um, probably tomorrow to get your input. We did that last time as well, and we got really good positive feedback and good information and um, input about how we can improve. So we appreciate you are doing that. We're really anxious to hear hear how that how how this works for you, as well as to give us ideas for future webinars that we might um, might want to be presenting to you. So next slide, please. I do want to take a few moments from our agenda um, to talk a little bit about the State Historic Preservation Plan. And um, just a reminder, since I uh, just have a few minutes, uh, that this is a, another effort that our office is responsible for undertaking. Uh, we are required as a result of the National Historic Preservation Act um, to prepare a State Historic Preservation Plan. I think several of you have heard me talk about this before, so I just want to give you a quick update that um, at long last, I'm getting ready to send out to, to all of you our first draft of the plan and uh, looking for you to take a look at that and provide us with feedback on how to be, we can improve that to um, um, to be the best plan that, that it can be to chart the course of the historic preservation community over the next five years. Uh, the title of our plan coming up in 2021 to 2026 is Inhabiting Our History. And um, we have five goals that 
uh, that we have prepared for you to take a look at, as well as other material that you will want to review. I'll be sending out that to all of you uh, later on this month, and I'll be, I, th I think it's really important that, that you take a look at this or are aware of this at least, uh, because all of you here today that are joining us are really our partners in preservation. Uh, so what you will be hearing today um, during our subsequent presentations also tie into the work and the goals in the State Historic Preservation Plan. Um, I will be communicating with you via email. I will be including uh, our draft as attachments for you to look at. Um, I think it's really important that uh, that you recognize, though, that um, the, the goals that we've come up with and the various strategies and tasks uh, that are included in the plan um, have been put together as a result of extensive public outreach efforts. I know many of you have, have made comments and provided input for us. Uh, we've taken that to heart. I think it's really well informed by your input as well as what is going on, um, as well as things that are currently going on. So um, in terms of COVID pandemic, and as well as the recent events that have taken place, um, as a result of the George Floyd incident just a few weeks ago. So it's really timely and, and very important that, that we move forward and can use uh, those, um, you know, those kinds of, of um, incidents and events, as well as trends that, that have been occurring over the past several years to inform where we need to go as a historic preservation community in the future. So be looking for that in the future, in your future, in your inbox, and I'll be looking forward to hearing from you. And of course, always feel free to, to contact me offline later about questions with that and any kind of feedback. And I think that that's my contact information is in the next slide as well. And actually, I think the next slide is our, our draft mission statement um, that I'll I'll let you know or show that to you real briefly um, as I transition to our next speaker since it is 945. So to get, have our agenda moving, we've got a lot of material to cover, a lot of information um, with a couple of breaks, again, five minute breaks. Um, again, there's my contact information, email and phone number, as well as our links to, to our, um, our current uh, State History Preservation Plan, you can see on my contact information. But I want to now transition to um, to our first speaker, our first presenter this morning, which is Holly Borth, who is our Built Environment Compliance Reviewer. And Holly has really taken on the role of being kind of our, our major duomo, as I like to say, of our Built Environment uh, Review Compliance Unit. Um, so Holly will be talking about about pointers and what our expectations are about working with us in terms of con consulting with us under Section 106, Executive Order 0505, and SEPA. So thank you very much, Holly. So I'll turn it over to you for, uh, for the next presentation. And thanks again to all of you for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all for uh, attending and thank you, Greg, for that lovely introduction. Um, we all look forward to the preservation plan. Um, so yeah, so I will just get started. I'll just jump right in here um, and say, you know, that I am the Built Environment Compliance Reviewer for DAP. Um, and so I'm gonna take you through what our expectations are as far as um, how the consultation process would work for the three different regulatory reviews that we perform at DAP, um, and this is all specific to the built environment. Um, and I also want to say ahead of time that we often get the question of, you know, when is DAP going to have a policy about this, or does DAP have a policy? And more, most often the answer is going to be no, uh, because the consultation process itself is pretty, we try to keep it as consistent as possible, and that's something that I'm trying to do here as well. But having policies would just um, would cause too it would be too conflicting, um, 
and as soon as we as soon as we did put a policy in place we would probably have a project that would make us undo it so we we do not typically have policies but we do have expectations so um, that's what we're going to take you through today as far as how to consult with us um, so we'll just go ahead and get started so first I want to show you a little bit um, so first I want to introduce you to the DAP consultation corgis um, on the left we have Howard and on the left is Lilo and um, they are off today but they wanted to make sure that they were included in the presentation to offer little bits and pieces of information for you um, so I just wanted to share with you kind of how the compliance review at DAP is organized uh, as far as so starting at the top we of course have Dr. Rob Whitlam who performs 106 and 0505 for archaeology reviews and then we have our two transportation archaeologists, Dennis Wardlaw and Sydney Hansen, and our local SEPA archaeologist, Stephanie Jolivet. And they all come to me when they have projects that have a built environment component. And then when we have the built environment involved, we have Michael Hauser, who's our expert at getting things listed and what's eligible, Nick, our expert for effects and design questions, um, Greg, our expert for planning questions, and of course, the preservation plan itself and Kim Gantz, our wizard expert, and forms questions. Um, and so the one thing that I really wanna convey in this uh, presentation, or in this slide specifically, is that you, many of you have been working with DAP longer than I've been here, and you know we're not perfect. Me coming in has kind of reorganized the way the BEU operates. Um, I am intended now to be a kind of one-stop consultation shop for all the regulatory reviews. So especially for like 06, 106, you know, I'll take you from initiation all the way to an MOA, although hopefully we never get to an MOA, right? So you might have questions that you know, like, you know, if, if you want to know if we, we're going to think it's eligible, so you're going to ask Michael um, and things like that. Uh, but if you're having questions and you're doing a survey of some sort and it's under a regulatory review that I am going to be reviewing, your question should probably come to me first. And if I have further questions, then I will take it to the appropriate person. But that's something that I really want to convey here is if you're doing anything under a regulatory review, I will be your point of contact for DAP, um, for the built environment. So moving on, we'll just get started with the big boy here. It's section 106. It's the federal regulation that has inspired a lot of what has happened since then. Um, so first, I want to acknowledge that we do have an inbox specifically for Section 106 consultations. It is at the top of the slide here, 106.dap.wa.gov. Um, so if you are doing anything under the 106 uh, compliance, we ask that all the consultations be sent directly to that inbox, and you might know who the reviewers are going to be. So if, if you know Rob is going to review the archaeology, you can CC Rob. If you know that it's a transportation project and Dennis or Sydney are involved, you can CC them, or maybe you send it directly to them. I know they operate a little differently. Um, and then if there are like HPI forms, feel free to see, see me, but we always ask specifically to make sure that you send it directly to the 106 inbox. That helps us, that helps multiple people beyond just the reviewers have access to that inbox. So if I'm not around, um, then someone else can take a look at it and uh, we can get you a response as soon as possible. So the steps of section 106, I'll just take you uh, through that. And uh, so we start with consultation, um, initiating consultation, and that often is started by uh, consultation on the area of potential effects. And so when it comes to the built environment, we understand that there's, you know, there's the ground disturbing area, and then there might be more effects that to the built environment specifically. So we want to know, um, we want a description of the area of potential effects and a justification for how it was defined what effects did you anticipate and how are they considered in the ATE? And one size does not fit all. So you might have a sidewalk project in downtown uh, Redmond and you're doing very similar work there to a project in Spokane, but we're not going to expect the ATE to always be the same, even if it's a very similar project. We wanna understand that the context of the area is considered and also like different effects and different potential for effects. Is, um, so just including that, um, is really important for the built environment as well. And then if you also want to include methodology, um, a justification for that. So it's 
it, if you're saying your AP is so large, but you're not going to survey everything, we want to know how that decision was made and the factors that were included in that decision because we have to agree with it. And I need to know that I can um, that I can be on board with this methodology. Um, and before I get any further, I also want to say that you can we do ask that we be consulted separately on each step um, so that we can do it one step at a time and get everything cleared up to make it as smooth as possible. But we do understand a lot of times maybe you want to lump things together, especially APE and methodology. That makes sense. Um, if you want to do the whole like APE two effects in one letter in one consultation, you're welcome to do that. But it's just a matter of being prepared that we might have questions about how your APE was defined and we won't even get to eligibility or effects before we can resolve those issues. So it's just a, a risk management um, process for you. So after we have methodology, the consultant or you have done the survey, then we have eligibility and there's the four national register criteria and the seven aspects of integrity. And Mike will get into the specifics about how we have expect those to be balanced and the narrative to be written um, later on today. And then we have effects, you know, the definition of an adverse effect, uh, which I don't need to get in here into here. And then resolution of adverse effects, um, which always has to end in an MOA. So next we have Governor's Executive Order 0505. Um, again, we have a specific inbox. It is 0505 at zap.wa.gov. And if you're doing anything under this order, we ask that the um, communication be sent directly to the 0505 inbox. And again, if you know the reviewer, you're welcome to CC them, but always make sure that you send it to the 0505 inbox. Um, so when is 0505 even considered? Specifically, it is capital state funding, and um, it has to be construction funding. So if it's pre-design or design, we also, we are welcome, we always welcome like questions and we're happy to look at it and let you know if we're going to have concerns or if we won't, but we often don't provide formal comments or like specific details of our expectations or what our thoughts are until it gets to the construction phase. Um, and then, so once we have, that funding, uh, 0505, it requires all state agencies to consult with DAP, FOIA, and the tribes to consider how projects might impact significant cultural and historic places. We recognize that there is no specific process outlined in the current version of 0505. Um, so we just ask for the built environment uh, to follow standard historic property protocol, which we consider as outlined in how the regulations for Section 106 are defined, but we definitely take a looser interpretation of that and we're happy to work with each state agency and what they're able to do and what the funding is and just what are we able to accomplish. Um, you know, we, we definitely, there's, 0505 is definitely, a, uh, it's, it's a different process, but we do try to, especially when it comes to how we define effects and adverse effects, we do, look to section 106 for how we make those decisions. Um, we highly recommend that you contact us early and often. Um, if you are a state agency and you're hiring a consultant and they're telling you, you know, what it's gonna take to get something through DAP, you know, they have your best intentions in mind, but no one can tell you what we want except us. So they might provide you guidance on a previous project, or you might have your own experience on a previous project and think that you know what we're going to want for a current project, but that might not be the case because every project is different. One size does not fit all. Um, we just we do ask that the resource, cultural resource work, including the built environment, be commensurate with the scope of work. Um, we have the easy one form for ground disturbing activities, and this can also be used um, as providing us just a first look if you're not even sure what. To send us, sending us an easy one form is a good first step. Um, and then from there, we can respond and tell you what more information we need, if anything. Easy twos um, are for non professionals, for built environment resources over 50 years in age or 45, maybe. Um, we often recommend a 45 age gap or age um, threshold. Um, this is, there's two specific reasons, and that's because if you're basing it off tax assessor dates, 
those are often inaccurate. Um, so it gives you a bit of a leeway there. And then also it to consider the time in which it might take for the project to actually go to construction, at which time the resource would become 50 and therefore meet the minimum threshold for eligibility. Um, we might ask for historic property, full historic property inventory forms if the building is proposed for demolition. So be prepared for that because this would be our last time to get that information. Um, historic property inventory forms must be filled out by a cultural resource professional. Um, and um, I think that's all I have on this slide. So we'll move on to the State Environment Policy Act or SEPA as it's more commonly known. We also have an inbox specific for SEPA. Um, it is at dpa at dap.wa.gov. Um, and SEPA for the built environment is very, um, very, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't think of the word I want to say. It's, it's very, there, I, DAP does not have a lot of options under SEPA for the built environment, um, I guess. It's, it's really up to the local jurisdictions. They're the decision makers. Um, when we're sent SEPA checklists, that is when we provide comments. Um, and we only, when we respond, our comments are just comments. The final decisions, which would include list, um, incorporating our requests, like say you want to demolish a historic house and we believe it's eligible. And the only thing is that the only review that's happening is a SEPA. And we ask for an inventory form to be done as mitigation it would be up to the local jurisdiction to condition the demolition permit with that request. We cannot require anything. Our comments are only comments. And one of the, and each jurisdiction is completely different. Um, I still haven't learned them myself, so I don't know. I'm still trying to learn when I write comments, can I expect them? Can I expect to hear back or, or not? It's, it's very up in the air every time. Um, and then as far as the demolition of listed prop properties listed in the historic, or gosh, in the National Register of Historic Places, we do expect it to trigger an environmental review, but again, we can't make any requirements. We would just highly encourage that to happen because the demolition of a listed property would meet the definition of an adverse impact to a historic property under the law, but we do not, we cannot require that review to occur. That would be, again, up to the local jurisdiction. Um, oftentimes, you might uh, complete an HPI form under SEPA. Um, and oftentimes, unless the local jurisdiction specifically asks us to make a determination, we accept the HPI forms um, and we review them for their completeness. Kim, can, uh, she'll tell you more about her process where when forms are submitted, she often does a quality control check. Um, and so she can do that review and accept them, but we might not make a DOE unless specifically requested by the local jurisdiction. So for all of these processes, and more specifically, I guess 106 and 0505, um, the we expect consultation to be initiated um, by a letter uh, from the lead agency. And we ask that that letter include who is the lead agency, what the regulatory context is, what is your project, and provide a description, uh, what activities are going to occur. And then also, so um, back on my 106 slide, and I mentioned, you know, how you can ask us to consult on just APE or methodology and split it all up or lump it together. Um, so just specify what parts of that are you asking for consultation on and concurrent? And then what do you want from DAP in response? Do you want a letter? Do you want a formal letter in response um, or a formal response of some sort? Or are you just looking for general comments? Um, so just more, just being specific about what you're looking for from us and what is the context. So consultation, again, more specifically under 106 and 0505, it's a government-to-government -government consultation. It's between the lead agency and SHPO DAP. Um, and then the consultants, um, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're down here um, under, you're happening under here, you know, you're working for the lead agency, your work represents lead agency, 
exclude agency if they accept your work and send it to us for consultation it reflects upon them um so uh at any point you know we under 106 or 0505 we may ask for more information um and you know it's again i recognize that i am coming in to a process that a lot of you have already experienced and so you know i have feedback that you're not maybe perhaps used to but we do have this opportunity um we always have this opportunity to ask for more information um and that could be include that could include clarification um what sources were used that maybe aren't clearly identified to make decisions uh, more historic context um either in the report or in the forms for each individual resource um for the project itself what alternatives were considered if any um and then we could also ask you know further consideration under a criteria um those are just some of the like majority of like what our comments tend to be um but it could be there are other options as well so wizard um at this point consultation is not a wizard tool um we ask that any consultation letters be kept out um in we do not receive notification if something is submitted in wizard so that is again why we emphasize sending an email to the regulatory inbox that's how we will know that something is ready to review and that you are ready for us to look at it um and as far as your report itself and the hpi forms um you know it's important to make sure that the forms that you're saying are a part of the project are attached to the project in wizard and that includes um, forms that might have a previous determination of eligibility because even if you're not if that eligibility was done within the last 10 years you know you're not asking for us to look at it again but it still needs to be attached to the current project so that it can be so that we understand that it's a part of this project um but it's just you know it's the eligibility has been previously determined and it's important for project tracking um, and for record keeping for the future people in in these roles um and we only so yeah so the most important thing um to know is that we only begin reviews after we receive a request for consultation from the lead agency. So under 106, that's the lead federal agency, and under 0505, it's from the lead, lead state agency. So if you're consultants and you're emailing us to tell us that a report is ready, we appreciate it, um, but we need to know that the lead agency is ready for us to look at it. Um, so we need to hear from them because we need to know that they've looked at it, they approve it, they agree, and we need a letter stating that from them as well. So I just want to take you through a little bit about the process itself and things that I'm looking for. So when we have areas of potential effect or impact, like I said before, one size does not fit all. And here, um, I just kind of drew like a blog. Um, I don't know why I did that, but let's just say, I don't know, they want to build a wall around Tacoma. Um, so what I would, so if, so, so say it's FEMA and they want to build a wall. And so I'm going to want to know how is it defined? What effects did you consider and does the map match the written description so if you're saying you know that the ate is the footprint of construction and is considering adjacent parcels then we want to see the adjacent parcel drawn into the ate because when you follow the regulations you're only expected to survey what's in the ate so we want to make sure that the boundaries match the description and we want to make sure that we can agree that you considered all the effects that we're concerned about and that it's drawn appropriately the methodology essentially is if you if it's 50 or 45 depending on what you decide to do um and it's in the ape essentially that's saying that you're you're saying that it has the potential to be affected so we want it we would expect it to be recorded and evaluated um and if you're going outside of that methodology you know and you're saying we only need to survey a certain portion of the ape you know that's that's definitely a decision for the federal agency to make, but we need to know how that was made and why, and we because we need to agree to it as well. So you've done the survey, you've done the report, and the agency, you've looked at it and you sent it to DAP for review. So um, 
So just a few things that I'm looking for when I review the report as well. And, um, you know, you can see our standards for cultural report, cultural resource reporting as well. Um, I always try to make sure that if I have comments that I refer to the specific parts of those standards. Um, so the most common things that come up are going to be the project description, uh, making sure that it's clear and also very specific uh, methodology that's justifiable, a historic context that is specific to the APE um, or API, um, and that the survey results align with everything. And so for the historic context, the one main point I want to get across is that um, the context is intended to contextualize the historic resources that were identified, right? So, um, so definitely the history of the state and the county are important to an extent, but what we are really concerned about is, you know, this residential neighborhood. Um, when was it platted? Who surveyed it? And um, when was it? developed and is it post World War II? Okay, so then it's connected with like these really significant parts of history. And it's also important to know now that the historic period and has entered the 1970s. So describing that history into the 1970s will be important because that's those are the resources that you're surveying. Um, and so it's also very important to make sure that the context you provide is a context that can be applied to the resources you found and vice versa. I mean, it's intended to work to be to limit the amount of work that we're really expecting um, because we expect that the context in the report matches the resources that were identified and how they would be eligible um, and that to help contextualize, especially for criterion A, which Michael will get into later. Um, so the survey results, you know, we just ask for three essential things, the data, your analysis and interpretation, and your recommendations. And we just ask for your, you to show your work and how you took us through that process. Um, your keys to success are going to be to involve DAP and the tribes early and often, and to never hate, hesitate, <laughs> also never hate, but never hesitate to contact us with questions. And again, if you have a question that's specific to the built environment under a regulatory context, contact me.